this is about how to represent the intermediate thing because Vicky said she wanted talks about the day-to-day -day work of machine learning. I spend so much of my time sitting, staring at a couple of functions that I have maybe stubbed out going, okay, but like, should I use a dictionary? Should I use a custom class? And this is this talk is my attempt to articulate some of the thought patterns that I use for figuring that out. So data structures are often really clear at the beginning and end of whatever it is that you're doing. So in my case, I work on um, I work on our platform. And so this is often API boundaries. I know what's coming in and I know what's going out partly because I have had a lot of design discussions about it. It's been ironed out. We've thought it through very carefully. Here's an example of an endpoint that I wrote where I have a bunch of data about a game. My company makes a, an interactive narrative game uh, that you can play with your friends. So we have a bunch of data about the game and what's going on. I need to return a ranked list of the best words for the situation with some metadata about those words and why they're ranked that way. Okay, cool. That's that's very well defined. But then at the next step, I feel like everything kind of drops off and it's easy to expect that how to structure things in between should be obvious. Uh, but it's not actually. Uh, or if it is, please tell me because I missed that. <laughs> I missed that memo. If it is obvious, it might not even be the best thing. For example, you might be following patterns that are used everywhere else in the code base, which is good for consistency, but it doesn't mean it's the right thing to use there. Or maybe you are in a very strong habit of always, I don't know, making a list and appending to the end of the list, and that's all you ever do. Also, the problems don't usually perfectly match basic Python data structures, right? So like if you go Google, as I did once upon a time as a baby software engineer, because I was a data scientist and I wanted to get better at software engineering. How do I pick a Python data object? What you wind up with is like, okay, pick a list if it's okay being mutable and you wanna sort it, pick a tuple. I hate saying words out loud that people disagree on pronunciation. I'm gonna say tuple. Uh, pick a tuple if it needs to be immutable, write a custom class if you need to define methods and stuff, but like it, it never matches up that well. I so rarely have a machine learning engineering problem where, oh, the thing I need to do is have a chunk of things that are all the same type and are immutable, and that solves my problem. Great. Um, so it gets complicated and often bane of my existence. Multiple ways will usually work. So it's kind of about picking the best one and the one that works for what you're trying to do. So getting it wrong, at least in my world, is not really the end of the world. It's annoying, it causes friction, it will waste time. And I don't like doing that. So I would rather figure out how to do it right off the bat. Ultimately, this isn't a coding problem, this is a decision-making problem. It's about how you access and associate information. Because at least for now, it's still mostly human brains that are reading and writing the code. There's Copilot, but like you still have to be able to understand what's going on and you or some unfortunate colleague is going to have to debug what's going on. So it makes sense to start with how you are associating the information you're working with. So start with what you know. Write down all of your needs and constraints, by which I mean literally physically write it down. Um, there are things you have in your head and things you have in front of you in the physical world, those are very different things. And the ones in your head are a lot more fuzzy than you might think they are until you try to write them down. So no matter how silly it feels, if you are looking at this kind of problem, get everything in your head, out of your head, as messily as you need to. My researcher and designer friend tells me that this is called an affinity map, if you'd like something interesting to Google. Um, basically just get everything you know onto the page, move it around, figure out explicitly how you make those connections. Uh, and that's a really good starting point for finding a common thread that runs through it, especially if you're trying to do um, a fairly complicated set of things that are kind of hard to hold in your head at once. Um, so for example, that endpoint that I showed earlier, I need to go get a bunch of words, score them for a variety of metrics, and then sum all that up into a weighted sum and, and sort the list and return it. That's not too many steps, but 
you wind up needing to access it in several different ways. I just got a visit from my dog. This is Fury. Come say hi. Come on. This is Fury, everyone. Hello. The next thing that I prefer to think about is how sure are you? This is my accidental argument for cowboy code, but consider it cowboy code because when you are committing to more structured and more rigid data types, so in this case, I'm talking about like defining a custom class instead of using a dictionary, you get certain benefits from that. You get more certainty and predictability in how things will break. Um, you can access things a little easier sometimes, but you need to be more sure because it's going to be more of a pain in the butt to make a change. Um, I have shot myself in the foot with this several times, trying to get too precise too soon and then having to go rewrite it. And it's annoying. Um, so just go with the least committed you can get away with. I, I do want to caveat that this is, um, I work for a startup. I'm not writing financial software. <laughs> I can, my goal is to write good code efficiently and not spend more time than it needs to have. So staying a little bit flexible in the first layer of implementation can actually be really helpful. Um, and harder to make a change, not as in literally you can't do it, it just takes time and refactoring. Once you know how sure you are, my best piece of advice is to make the code match your brain. Humans index things by name pretty intuitively, which is why I love Python dictionaries. Um, it is so much easier to say, you know, give me words dot genre score than words at the whatevereth element of the tuple or list that you've stuck on there. Um, honestly, this whole talk could have just been titled Dictionaries Are the Best. Probably use those if you're in doubt. Um, they offer a really nice balance of ease of access. You have some methods that let you be a little more careful and defensive, right? You can use get for carefully checking to see if something exists in the dictionary. You can use a default dictionary if you do want to accumulate things as you go. Um, I, I am a dictionary fan. And again, there are usually several ways to do this. Um, I find that pair programming is really great for not going down the rabbit holes of I could do it this way or I could do it this way. Um, but this is why that step where you write everything down is very helpful because you can start to extract patterns for how you're thinking about it. Um, the next point I have is on the next slide, which is that you should blend data structures if you need to. And that's part of making that code match your brain. So the example I was just thinking of is when I'm thinking about words, <laughs> specifically the words that I'm talking about in the example problem that I gave with the API spec, I tend to think about them in terms of the word string itself and the part of speech. That's just like the easiest, um, unique way of identifying the words. Often I need to access the whole word object, which has other metadata in it in order to do stuff. There's no reason you can't make a dictionary where the key is that tuple of word string and part of speech, and the value is the entire word object. Um, because that's how I think about the problem, that's how I think about solving the various intermediate steps I need to do, making the calculations I need to make. And so if I make the data structure match that, the whole thing flows and I'm much more likely to catch if I have missed some detail about how I needed to organize it. Again, you can tell I'm working for a little startup. Care about performance later. Seriously, even if you do need to care about performance, going down too many rabbit holes at once makes you code in circles. You will get halfway down figuring out the correct data structure for the problem at hand. And then you'll start going, OK, wait, but like, is that going to parallelize well? Will I be able to submit this to some other thing? Like, don't. Just, just get it all the way ironed out because then you have a first draft to optimize against. Um, it is so much easier to evaluate the pros and cons of a structure you have chosen and written down 
than halfway thinking through three or four different ones. I would just like to point out that nobody has this solved or it would be automated as a refactoring tool in PyCharm and also Copilot would provide it for you. Part of my grand goal for this talk was to write a flowchart and I could be famous on the internet forever. I could sell it like flashcards and it would just have like a series of questions and you would go all the way to the end and it would tell you what data structure to use. Maybe someday, um, but it turns out that what you actually need is to think about how your brain thinks about your particular data. And you'll start to see patterns. Um, like I said, a lot of the stuff I do lately has to do with associating words with other things. Dictionaries lend themselves really nicely to that. So when in doubt, I just use a dictionary. You will probably also eventually wind up with shorthands for your flavor of data. Um, but if you do have it automated, let me know. And this is a fractally repeated process. So what do you have? What do you need? And how are you going to access what you need out of the data and the objects to get there? This applies at the API interface level, what's going in, what's coming out. This applies with any major function that's happening behind that endpoint. And it applies to each smaller function within there. So to take the word score ranking examples and apologies for not having any outlined code examples on the slide. Like I said, the internet ate them. Um, for each of those words, I need to get scores for a handful of different metrics. I want to normalize those scores within a metric, which means that I need to have all of those scores at once. So that might influence, OK, I probably don't want to accumulate it only by word and then make it hard to get out again all of the scores for a particular metric. So like all of the genre scores, I'm going to need those all at once. And if you do this at each layer, it usually becomes pretty clear how to structure the things that you're starting with. OK, I would like to end with some of my heuristics. I just told you it's not a solved problem, and I am absolutely going to throw some hot takes out here. Use a dictionary if you are a human with a human brain. This is always my starting point. Default dicks, as I mentioned, are really nice if you want to smoothly add things as you go. I actually used this for those word scores because I didn't want to set in stone what the scoring metrics were going to be. Like we might add some others and some words might not have all of them. I didn't want it to blow up if I needed to add a new score. Classes are great if you have put more thought into what you're doing. If you're more sure about it, go ahead, use a class. Um, I love Pydantic because I am a massive typing fangirl. Um, I convinced my entire data science team to adopt type annotations in my first real job. It was great. Um, but classes kind of lock you in a little bit more. Lists are great for if you have stuff, you might want to sort it. You don't care if it's mutable. Everyone has been bitten by the mutable lists bug that they accidentally wrote into their code. And if you haven't, your time will come. Uh, tuples are great if they need to be immutable. They're not going to change. I only use them if I only have a few things because you can't really access them intuitively, right? Like you're accessing them by index unless you use a named tuple. Um, so I don't think those are great for collecting long sets of things. I will be honest, every time I think I'm going to use a named tuple, I wind up just using a dictionary or a lightweight custom class. Um, like I go in one direction or the other. I guess in that situation, if your data really need to be immutable, it might work. Um, but I would, I would love to hear from people who actually use these on a regular basis because I always want to and I always wind up um, not doing it. So these are my heuristics. I would love to hear everyone else's. Develop your own. You'll get a feel for the kinds of data you work with. Thank you.